Good to see everybody. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. I, I saw jo Dr. John Holgan, uh, who is, I'm not sure if he's still here, and Dr. John Granito and Bill Neville, um, and Dr. Bob England, who are four people who actually created today. And they created today, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, when the fire service was not too much uh, academically oriented, and uh, these men in their infinite wisdom took the time and effort to bring us around, and, and I want to thank each of you for your leadership and the impact that you've made on our world. Uh, I also want to recognize Dean Ed Kirtley from OSU and a former state director, and Dr. Manny Fonseca, a chief down in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and, and uh, Chris Neal, who are both on the National Fire Academy Board of Visitors. Um, I was listening to my two pre preceding uh, speakers, uh, Denny Compton and, and Chief uh, Dr. John Granito, and, and two of them actually talked about the same themes, uh, which were the political process, uh, change, and leadership. And uh, I'm not going to be too far off the mark. As a matter of fact, I was pretty surprised uh, that the three of us hadn't gotten together because a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about over the next 35 years uh, all stem from those three seminal thoughts, the political process and um, change in leadership. And uh, to kind of reiterate or maybe put into a little bit of a closer focus what Chief Compton talked about in terms of uh, politics, uh, the political process is the environment in which the fire and emergency services exists. And the fire service, if the fire service decides that it's going to eschew politics, that it's going to ignore politics, it's more or less like a drowning person trying to ignore water. It's, it's just not going to work. The second theme, change, uh, there are among us, I think, a group of men and women in the fire and emergency services who think that we are just going to hunker down in this uh, this environment, and uh, it, we're going to go back. All right, we're going to go back to the old days. We're going to go back to the old ways. And I got a hot flash for all of you. We are not going back. Going back is over. History is over. It's as ancient history as the Peloponnesian War. We're just not going back. And, and leadership. And I think uh, Dr. Ganito took a great deal of effort to kind of slice <laughs> Uh, the difference between leadership and management. I think Denny did a good job as well, but uh, I like a little bit more of a pedestrian view. Uh, I think the difference between uh, management and leadership is akin to the difference between reading a sex manual and making love, okay? There's, there's a big difference. So um, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this morning was what we see coming down the, the world in terms of the future of the fire and emergency services, and it really has to do with uh, professional development. If you looked at what Dr. Granito said, if you looked what Chief Compton said, they both spoke about the changes that we're going through and how that environment is changing. They also talked about how you're going to deal with it. So the two basic themes of my talk this morning, the beginning pieces of it will be the changes that we see coming up uh, immediately and over the next 20 to 35 years, and then what we see uh, I'm very happy to tell you about some of the things that uh, we see coming in the, in the professional development of the fire and emergency services. So really the theme is uh, the professional development. And the challenge that our leaders are going to face in all of our organizations is that we're playing with one hand tied behind our back. We think that we control the future, but we don't. We simply exist in an environment in the fire service and emergency services exist in an environment, a political environment, a community environment, a fiscal environment that we really don't control. All of the controlling factors of all of that are outside of our hands. And we're not alone. If you look at many of the organizations in our country are going through tremendous revolutions and tremendous changes. The music industry, two years ago, Apple Computer, 72% of the profits and Apple Computer were based on them selling songs that they owned over the uh, iOS uh, software package. And today, no one is buying songs off Apple anymore. Well, they are, but not to the extent that they are because of internet-based radio and the people's ability to program uh, their own music. So uh, now Apple is scrambling for it to deal with changes. And of course, the publishing industry is, is struggling right now in all sorts of different ways. The newspaper industry 
is going, in many cases, out of business. And of course, uh, the colleges and universities that are struggling with the bricks and mortar traditional kinds of organizations versus the online schools and you know, what's valid and what's invalid. And, and of course, uh, I ask all of you, when was the last time you held a photograph in your hand? And how many of you have a hard drive with 20,000 pictures on it uh, categorized by years and months or trips? And when was the last time any of you received a handwritten letter or actually saw one that wasn't on a PBS show or something, okay? So even around the world, dictatorships around the world, governments are changing because of the rapid communication ability. And now, if you look at um, the, what we refer to commonly as the Arab Spring, what these countries are doing, and even in our own country is doing, that once there is a moment or a scintilla of evidence that we're going to be dealing with civil unrest, the first thing they do is shut down the communications ability. Because as far back as 10 years ago at the G8 conference in Seattle, Washington, the police found out that they were at a disadvantage because the demonstrators had better communications amongst themselves than the police department did. All right, and that's how uh, they lost control of that event uh, in Washington. So if you think that the fire and emergency services is going to stay the same, if we're not going to be affected by this, uh, you really don't have a clue. There's a tremendous, tremendous changes that are going on. And the only way that we're going to be able to negotiate this environment is that we need career and volunteer professionals. And those are men and women with the education, the training, the experience, and the continuing education who man manage to stay current who are, are going to lead us through this process. And I have very, very simple definitions, much like my definition of the difference between management and leadership. Um, Education is about knowing. Education is about negotiating the future. And education is about learning how to learn. Training is about history. Training is about the perfection of technique, the things that you do and you continue to try to improve that. Experience is taking your education and your training to deal with a new environment. And then finally, continuing education is the requirement of a professional that uh, that they remain current in their field. And there are two thoughts that I always hear about. Uh, one is that people say to me, O'Neill, you don't understand. The career fire service are municipal employees. And um, we are not controlled by our profession. We are controlled by the employment practices of our employer, our cities. And I take great effort to explain that there are plenty of teachers that work for cities and attorneys that work for t cities and nurses and doctors who work for cities. And if they lose their license to practice, they are out of work. No school system is going to tell the teacher that lost his or her license, oh, you're really a great teacher and the kids love you. We're going to let you teach anyway. And in the volunteer service will tell me quite frequently that they're volunteers and that they can't be held to professional standards. And to them, I say the same thing. There are plenty of doctors and nurses and lawyers who volunteer. And they're still held to professional standards. If you're a physician and you are a surgeon and you go to sub-Saharan Africa to do surgery on children with cleft palates, you are still held to the standards of professional medical practice, whether you do it for free or whether you get $10,000 to do it. It doesn't matter. So the fire and emergency services will become a profession when the profession can pull your ticket to practice independent of your employer. That's the click. That's when the switch will go on. And I, I know I won't be around to see that, but that's where this is all going. Um, the future, future success of the fire and emergency services is solely dependent upon their preparation for tomorrow. Yesterday's war stories simply aren't going to cut it anymore. And experience alone will not help because experience alone, the things that we're going to be experiencing in the future, we could never predict. They've never been experienced by anyone before. Apple Computer never thought that they'd be losing money on songs. And then finally, the rate of change is accelerating at a pace that, that we can't keep up. That, that I, I don't think I have to tell anybody about that. So 
When you look at the environment that I described in the fire and emergency services, that political environment, that fiscal environment, that community environment, you can go back to ancient history. And we talk about, everybody talks about the dinosaurs and the di dinosaurs dying off. And a lot of people think that the dinosaurs died off because they were old. Well, that's not true. The dinosaurs died off because the environment changed and they didn't. Now, the alligators and the dinosaurs lived at the same time. The alligators are still around. As a matter of fact, they have two cable television shows on right now about people who kill alligators. Looks like some of you watch those shows. I got a few there, but OK. The alligators adapted, continually adapted. So my admonition for the fire and emergency services is simply this. If you don't like change, you're going to hate extinction, OK, because that's the way of the world. Those are the things that are changing. So one of the things that we see going on, <clears throat> the first is the sociological changes that we see going on in our country. Uh, the biggest one is the statistical blip that has been going through our society since the day they were born, the baby boomers. Now, these are men and women born between 1946 and 1964. Uh, they have been the statistical falls going through our society since the day they were born. There were the reasons that hospitals built maternity wards and maternity hospitals. There were the reasons that they built grammar schools and high schools. They were the only generation in the history of America to fight a war and go to college at the same time. There were the yuppies, the muffies, the puppies. Uh, they created the housing market and they crashed the housing market because they no longer want to maintain their mansions. And now they're beginning to the healthcare system. The beginning of the baby boom generation turned 65 in January of 2011. And at, they are turning 65 at 10,000 people a day. Now, if you go back to the data, 92% um, is from the New York Times, 92% of all women who can have children in those years did. A baby was born every eight seconds for 18 straight years. The average life expectancy right now for a boomer is about 82 and a half, but the projections fairly soon will be about 85. And for those of you who study demography, you'd be quick to point out to me, O'Neill, you're wrong, that the average American male uh, life expectancy is 76, and the average female life expectancy in the United States is 78. That's correct. The day you're born. If you're born today, if you're a woman, your life expectancy is 78. If you're a man, your life expectancy is 76. But if you're a boomer, your life expectancy just went up. Because all the men in, see, you have to understand that it's an average. And the, all the men in this room went through that period in their life when they were driving down the highway 90 miles an hour with a can of beer between their knees, the radio blasting in their arm around the girl. That sucks down the averages. <laughs> yeah. And all the women in the room who rode with us and didn't say anything, that sucks down the averages too. Once you get a spouse and a mortgage, your life expectancy goes through the roof, OK? And uh, if you don't believe me, just ask yourself this question. How old was I when I got my driver's license? And what was my car insurance bill, or my parents' car insurance bill? And uh, what was my car insurance bill when I turned 25? Quite a bit different. So, um, so if you take a boomer born in 64, the end of the boomer generation, and you add 85 years to that, we've got the, the life expectancy of the boomers will be reaching their life expectancy in the year 2049. So we've got about 35 years of a couple of things. Uh, this is a little, I don't have to make this stuff up, I'm sorry. I don't have to make this stuff up. This is from an, a magazine called the American Association of Retired People. They're selling motorcycle insurance to senior citizens. Why? because they're the only ones that can afford those $35,000 Harleys, OK? Um, but we know a couple of things about senior citizens. We've got 40 years of data to tell us that uh, senior citizens are the high-risk group for fires, they're the high-risk group for accidents, and they're the high-demand group for EMS. Now, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. We know that there are going to be increased uh, numbers of people who are incapable of self-care. They're moving back to cities to get better health care. Who's from a real small town here? Raise your hand. Help me out here. Small town. 
Ma'am, Susan, what town are you from? Perkins. How many people in Perkins? 6,000. Anybody smaller than 6,000? You got it. You're going to help me out here. Um, I live in Perkins, and I go to the doctor. I've got a headache. The doctor says, you don't have a doctor in Perkins? Okay. You're helping me out here. Thank you. And I go to the doctor, and the doctor says, uh, geez, we did a, te a head x-ray on you, and you've got a brain tumor. What are the chances of me getting brain surgery in the Perkins University Medical Center? Zero. Okay, I got a choice. Either I'm going to move or I'm going to die. That's it. So uh, the seniors are moving to, uh, to cities into places where they're getting better medical care, more access to medical care. They're also changing their housing patterns. Uh, they're moving into congregate housing, condo-type buildings, and um, they have three levels of living in them, and they're in every community in America. Uh, you are independent living. You, get an, you buy an apartment for $175,000. There's a parking garage attached to the building, and you can come and go as you please. You've got a one- or a two-bedroom apartment, a small kitchenette, and um, life is good. Uh, you're there a few years, you begin to need a little bit of extra assistance, uh, and you go on assisted living. Now, assisted living, uh, they come up every day and they check, and they look in your refrigerator, oh, Mr. O'Neill, I see you got water, you got juice, uh, here's your box of pills, you took all of your pills for Saturday, very good. Uh, we're going to change your diaper at 4 o'clock, tonight the movie's Gone with the Wind, and tomorrow we're going on a trip to the zoo. Okay, that's your life. Um, you're there a few more years. Uh, you begin to need full nursing care. You're in a, in a hospital bed. Uh, and I'm not going to do the math on this thing, but I'm going to give you some rough numbers. The insurance company or Medicare or somebody is paying about $300 a day to keep you in that bed. It's costing the nursing facility on the same premises, by the way, about $125 a day uh, to keep you alive. You begin to need more medical care, um, more medicine, 150 a day. They start hooking you up to tubes and wires, 175, 200 a day. Uh, now you need a little bit more intensive care treatment, and they have to have a nurse come see you. It's about 235 a day. What are they going to do in the nursing home when they're making 300 a day and it's costing them 235 a day to keep you alive? Who said pull the plug? That's not the new health care system. No. No, they're going to, I have went through this. They're going to call your family in to discuss hospice care. That's what goes on. All right? Now, it's sad. It's sad. But that's what's going on. That's life in the big city. That's not good news. It's not bad news. It's, it's information. Now, I'm just going to ask a question. How many people here, men and women, were in the military? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, John, you were Navy? Who's, and Sir, Mike, what branch were you in? Navy. In the Army? Marine Corps, you were in the Army. John was in the Marine Corps. Any other infantry? Infantry training, basic infantry training. They used to tell us to shoot to, I know you Marines, you know, one shot, one kill, one shot, two kills. But in the Army, they used to say, shoot to wound. Why? Right. It takes three to four people to take care of a wounded soldier, as opposed to a dead one that, that uh, doesn't need any care. Well, here's the point. You're going to send engine, when there's a hurricane, a flood, a tsunami, a blizzard, a road washout, a power grid failure, some disaster, you're going to, they're going to start dialing 911 because the people who come to take care of them aren't coming to work that day. And you're going to send engine one with two fire, uh, three firefighters and a captain to take care of 400 walking wounded. These are going to be buildings filled with people who are either incapable of self-care or they are one day away from dying because of some critical medication that they need or some medical treatment that they need. And no one's talking about that. No one is looking at that as an issue. Again, it's not good or bad. It's the truth. They're moving to the senior to grave um, housing. But here's the big issue. These people have been punching the political buttons their entire adult lives. These were the men and women who told John, uh, Lyndon Johnson, you stop this war or we're going to fire you when Lyndon Johnson quit. They're the people who told Richard Nixon, you're a liar and a crook and either you quit your job 
or we're going to put you in jail and Richard Nixon quit. Well, I got a hot flash for you. They don't care about schools anymore. Their kids are raised. They don't care about roads anymore. They can't drive anyplace. The only thing they're going to care about is when they pick up the phone and dial 911 to get help, they want to hear sirens as they're hanging up the phone. And if they don't, they're going to engage the political process to make you do it. And if, you, and if they don't do it, their children are going to do it. Because their children, they don't live near their children anymore. The children are a thousand miles away. So they're going to engage the political process to either do one of two things. They're going to make the fire and emergency services respond to their needs, or they're going to get another organization to do it. Real simple. The environment is changing. We can take a look at other countries in the world and see what they're going through and take a look at the data and more or less kind of predict what's going to happen in the United States. Japan, in the days when I was coming up in the study world, uh, was the, one of the world's fire safest countries. All right? They were the country with the best uh, lowest fire death rate in the world, of the industrialized world. And uh, when you looked at the data, uh, their population age distribution in 2007, 21% were over 65. 2009, it got up a little bit higher. It's about 22, 23% in 2010, and, it, and it's accelerating as well. This is an eye chart. It doesn't mean a lot. I'm just going to show you. This is a, the this demographic distribution of age in 1930 in Japan, and you see a very even uh, slope of uh, young uh, to old. Uh, in 1930. In 1950, 20 years later, uh, you see kind of a squag, uh, you know, a lot of goofy data there. Does anyone know what that goofy data is there? World War II. Yeah. They lost a lot of young men and women, uh, both in the military and in civilian casualties. But if you look at 2000, you see that the distribution of age uh, begins to increase dramatically. And this is what they're predicting for 2050, that the median age of uh, Japanese men and women are going to be somewhere up around 70. And uh, as a result, when you look at their fire loss data, they're not doing so well anymore. As a matter of fact, they're probably among the most uh, unsafe uh, industrialized countries in the world. And the United States, even though we tout that we're one of the worst in the world, we're really not. We're about the, about the center. Uh, in terms of fire death rates by the country. If you look at who has improved the most and who has declined the most, the United States is right up there in reducing our fire death rate uh, down by two-thirds from um, about uh, 9 to 10,000 or 12,000 down to about 3,000. Uh, Japan has gotten about 10 percent worse. Uh, their rate has uh, decreased quite a bit. So. Um, if we to take Japan as a harbinger of things to come in the United States, uh, we can see what the aging population is going to be doing to our fire uh, death rate, and of course, uh, we know what it's going to do to our health care system. Some of the other environments in which the fire and emergency services exists uh, is a technological environment. And um, uh, this, is a, this is my hotel room here. I'm on government travel. No, it's not. You can tell you're on government travel because you're in a downtown hotel uh, surrounded by boarded up department store windows. Uh, attached to the no hotel that you're staying in is a 24-hour bail bondsman. And uh, somewhere within line of sight of the lobby of the hotel is a neon sign that says, Jesus saves. So that's, that's government travel. Um, but what we're seeing is that the, um, the heat release for the room contents has doubled or doubled and a half from ordinary combustibles, which is releasing heat rated about 8,000 BTUs a pound, to what is essentially hydrocarbon fuels, plastics, which release heat at between 16 and 18,000 BTUs. And Dan Madrakowski will be talking about this, um, what they're seeing in terms of the data. UL has some interesting studies. In the 1950s and 60s, they estimated that from an incipient fire to life-threatening fire, was about 18 minutes from the time a fire began till the time that you were probably either going to die or being close to dying in a fire was about 18 minutes. Today it's less than five. It's closer to three minutes because of all of the plastics that are used 
in, uh, in the combustible, uh, in the uh, furnishings of, of, uh, and contents of homes. Um, lightweight steel is being used all over the place. This is one of those uh, condo type buildings that we see uh, for senior citizens that they're buying in the over 55 communities. Uh, this is uh, something that we're seeing in New England. Uh, this is a school. And what they're doing is converting that school from a school to senior housing. And those of you who are in the fire and emergency services should be able to look at this building, see that it's a brick exterior, and then based on these lintels here, make some assumptions about the construction of the building. A, that it's wood interior, and uh, that it's a joist roof. Now, all of you who have seen these school buildings know that these buildings weren't built with peaked roofs. School buildings were built with flat roofs, which every one of them leaked. So when they're doing the conversions from a school to a uh, senior housing, they're converting the flat roof to a peak roof. But at 2 o'clock in the morning, when you've got a building full of walking wounded and a lot of smoke, and you're looking at this building, you're making some presumptions. All right, what you're looking at is a building that's been renovated from a flat roof to a, a, a peaked roof. It's really a new roof on an old building. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to make the presumption that it's a joy-supported roof, when in fact, it's a truss-supported roof. And not only is it a truss-supported roof, but the truss is all glued together. It's not even nailed together. Now, glue fails at 135 degrees. That thing's coming down like a ton of bricks. And if you don't believe me, when you're driving down the highway, they have tractor trailers now with stacks of wood on them, okay? And that's all trusses, all glued together to go build some other building. So the environment in which the fire and emergency services is working, the technological environment is, uh, is changing as well. Uh, this is a picture of a church where the um, pastor put solar panels on the roof. Now, what do you figure the chances are that that poor minister, priest, rabbi, whomever, took the time to get the engineering done to figure out whether that roof can hold the weight of those solar panels? Zero, correct. As a matter of fact, in New Jersey about six months ago, they had a warehouse fire the, com the roof was completely composed of solar panels. The building was worth $300 million. It was fully sprinklered. And the contents of the warehouse were worth $700 million. And the fire department had to watch it burn to the ground because they didn't know what to do about the solar panels. The sprinkler system was overcome and they lost the entire building. It was the largest lost fire in years uh, in New Jersey. So uh, this you're going to see a lot more uh, of people dealing with this. And this is a story from my own life. This is an electric bill. My brother is a uh, police, a retired police officer from Jersey City. He has all of the qualifications to be a, he was a lieutenant actually, uh, all the qualifications to be a lieutenant in the Jersey City Police Department, a third grade education and a mustache. That's, uh, he, you know, he picks on me, too. When he's out talking, he picks on me. Uh, he had to do his roof over, so he decided to have solar panels installed on his house. And the deal is uh, he sells any excess electricity back uh, to the electric company. It's an ideal situation. He and his wife are uh, empty nesters. His boys are all raised and out of the house. And um, when he's out working and she's out working, and the sun is shining, even when the sun isn't shining, he's creating electricity and sending it to the electric company. And like everybody else, you all have jobs in your house. Uh, if you're married, you know, one of you has a certain job, one of you pays the bills, and I'm the, I'm the fleet manager, the finance director, and the groundskeeper in my house. But in my brother's house, uh, his wife is the finance director, and they were on a budget plan for the electric. They reduced the amount of money that they were paying in the budget plan to like $40 a month. And, uh, but my brother was kind of curious as to what was the effect of the solar panel. So he called the electric company up and he said, look, I, I'm, I'm paying the budget and I don't mind, but would you just give me a, a meter reading and give me an actual bill? 
and they sent him an actual bill. This is my brother, Brian O'Neill, Jersey City, New Jersey. The electric company owes my brother $525 in six months. Okay? Now, my brother, being a cop, wrote them a letter and said, if you don't remit payment in 30 days, I'm going to cut you off. Uh, yeah. So I asked him, I said, Brian, um, let me ask you a question. What happens if, God forbid, there's a fire in your house? Because one of the first things the fire department does is shut the utilities off, the gas and electric. How do you shut the electric off on a panel? He goes, I'm a cop. I don't know. So we called him up. This is a couple of years ago. And he went, oh, we didn't think of that. So they put in a thing on the outside of the house that you can shut off the electric. But unlike the warehouse fire in Delran, New Jersey, uh, you've got to be able to figure out um, how to shut the electric off because you just, it, it just keeps going. It, you can't shut the electric off from the electric side of the house anymore. Another technological change that the fire and emergency services is dealing with. And of course, uh, the hazardous materials issues. Um, the transportation, the surface transportation, the pipe transportation, and the refinery of, of uh, fracking oil and uh, biodiesel fuels. Uh, they are estimating now, the United States is now for the first time since 1972 an oil exporting country. The back in crude oil that they're taking out of the ground in the United States is so purified that they can take the Bakken oil out of the ground and put it in a truck, gas tank or fuel tank, and they will be able to empty five full fuel tanks of Bakken crude oil before it does any damage to the filters in the engine in the diesel trucks. It's coming out of the ground uh, distilled at certain upper and lower flammable limits, and it varies widely. And the federal government, in its infinite wisdom, decided that the train companies or the rail companies have to notify the states every time one of these trains goes through their state. Pfft, are you kidding me? Do you know how much they're moving? And, you know, who's going to be dealing with this? You know, the rural communities are going to be dealing with this. And it's not a matter of making sure they have enough foam. It's just not going to cut it. They had an entire, not an entire, but they had a, a 47 people killed in, in uh, Canada. Uh, one of these trains derailed and, and started a fire. Okay, and we're going to be dealing with this. Another technological issue that the fire and emergency services are going to be dealing with is the fact that we're on camera 24-7. If there's an emergency, you're going to be out there. There's going to be a 10-year-old kid out there with an iPhone taking a picture of everything you do. And if you don't realize that everything you do in public is on being recorded, you don't have a grasp of reality. You walk down the street, the average American is probably on video 18 to 20 times a day. You go to an ATM, you buy gasoline, you walk down the street, you drive down the highway, you're on video. And a picture is worth a thousand words. Denny Compton was referring to some of the things that some firefighters do, you know, they put it up on social media, some of the, the bad things that they think. And, you know, where do you think Billy Goldfeder gets all that stuff? The changes. Uh, this is um, a slide that I, I got from a, a man named Gary Gruby, who was a senior fellow in Motorola. And I said, Gary, what does is, what is a senior fellow in Motorola do? And he said, I, like the Wizard of Oz, I sit around and think great thoughts, you know. He, he has 127 app uh, patents for communications technology at Motorola. And uh, he's quite a wealthy man. But he lent me this slide. It's pretty interesting, I find. It's two, two dots. Uh, the dot on the left is kind of going slow. And the dot on the right is, is blinking pretty fast. Uh, this dot on the left is the world's population. It's increasing by about four babies a second. So you take the number of people who are born in a second in the world. You subtract the number of people who die in a second in the world, and the answer is four. They're selling 25 mobile phones a second in the world. Now, if you work for Motorola or Apple or Samsung, that's great news. But if you're in the public sector, you're on video every day you go out. Everything you do is being recorded. And um, if you and the members of your department, again, don't realize that everything you do is being recorded, 
uh, you don't have a clue as to what you're dealing with. Uh, this is a little personal example. Uh, this is a speeding violation for uh, Dennis O'Neill. And uh, if you look down here, it says that on uh, June 12, 2010, I was tracked doing 48 and a 35. And uh, this is the, the uh, license plate number. And on the back of this letter that I received, it said, um, Dear Mr. O'Neill, you have a choice. Uh, you can pay us $40, which is the fine, or you can plead not guilty, in which case you'll have to appear at court. And uh, if you're found guilty, the fine will be $300 plus cost, court costs plus three points on your license because you just admitted you were driving. I said, here's your 40 bucks. Thank you very much because they can't see who's driving. And then I looked at the picture and I realized that's not my car. That's my wife's car. I said, Jan, you were speeding violating the law, and we are fine. She said, no, you dope, you were driving. It was my car. We were going to Washington that day with the kids. So uh, I didn't even get out of that one. Uh, this is kind of an interesting story in the New York Times. Kids going to Fort Lauderdale on spring break are behaving themselves now because they're afraid their friends will put them up on YouTube doing something stupid. So for all of you who had the opportunity to go to Fort Lauderdale and do something stupid, Good for you. Can't do it anymore. Um, but that's how uh, it's changing our society. So uh, what can you expect? Well, expect that every generation coming up is going to be different. Uh, your parents didn't think you were going to make it. Believe me, they didn't. Dr. John, I'm sure Ruth Ann, there were days when you said, this girl is just not going to make it. I don't know. Fortunately, she did. She's an attorney, now a very successful attorney in New York, and how neat to see your dad in action. And I hope that you enjoyed the honors that we've bestowed on him. What a neat guy. You have good taste in dads. Um, your grandparents didn't think your parents were going to make it. No generation, everything's the generation coming up behind them, is going to make it. And we're doing all sorts of scientific studies now because we have the ability to do that. But it's it's generational. It's been going on for millennia. Uh, Socrates said, you know, children today are tyrants. They gobble their food. They ignore their parents, and they tyrannize their teachers. You could say the same thing about kids today, right? So uh, we're expecting even more rapid communication, the social media, and, of course, that expect, as a result of a lot of different kinds of incidents that are going to be reported, that the fire services are going to be facing the same thing that our brothers and sisters in blue in the police department are facing, uh, the fees and triplets, mismal and non. Let me just run those by you. Misfeasance, you knew what to do, you were trained to do it, you made a mistake. Malfeasance, you knew what to do, you were trained to do it, you did it poorly. Nonfeasance, you knew what to do, you were trained to do it, you just didn't do it. You saw that firefighter going into a burning building without a Scott Pack of protective breathing, and you didn't say anything. You saw that firefighter go through a red light, and you didn't say anything. You could be sued for that. It's called nonfeasance. So I'll show you a day in the superintendent's office. Bill Neville misses this, I'm sure. Uh, this is something called the Freedom of Information Request. Uh, I get these all the time. This is dated September 6, 2007 from a New York law firm. Ruth Ann, I'm not going to say anything bad about New York lawyers here because you're here. But um, uh, how would you like to work in this firm with all these attorneys, okay? And what they want are the training records, any records really, uh, of the people involved in a fire uh, at the Deutsche Bank building, 130 Liberty Street. The fire was on August 18, 2007, where two firefighters died. Let me do the math for you. They died on August 18th. I'm getting a Freedom of Information Act on 2000, and, I'm sorry, September 8th, 6th, three weeks later. They're not even cold in their grave, and the lawsuits are starting. This is another article about the Super Sofa fire where they're going to indict people on criminal negligence for insufficient training and leadership. So uh, I'm not going to tell you all the bad stuff. I have some great news, and I'll tell you that's where we are right now, but here's where we're going. 
and that's about professional development. And I had a unique experience at the National Fire Academy two or three weeks ago. We had a professional development summit. Dr. Tony Brown was there. And just before one of the breaks, one of the people participating in the event got on the microphone and he said, folks, just before you go on break with all of the firefighters who are studying for a doctorate, please come down in the front. I'd like to have a meeting with everybody. I went, wow. I couldn't imagine that statement 10 years ago. How neat. Unfortunately, I had some crisis, some employee thing I had to deal with. and I had to leave. I didn't get to, to talk to the people in the meeting. But the doc program here at OSU, um, there are different programs going around the country and more and more and more uh, we're seeing research-based stuff. So what's a profession? A unique set of knowledge and skills. The skills transcend the organization that you can go in other organizations and do the same kind of work. There's some testing of competency and assurance of competency to the public. There's a code of ethics. There's a professional association. It's usually client-centered work. There's peer-reviewed research journals and scientific evidence-based practice. Those are the tenets of a profession in the United States. And when we look at that in the fire and emergency services, those tenets of professional development are training and certification, the experience levels, the education, associate, bachelor's, master's, and doc, and the continuing education requirements. That's pretty much uh, what that looks like here in the United States for the fire and emergency services. Our system um, works pretty well. Uh, we have a federal, state, and local level, and uh, colleges and universities with relationships around the country. Uh, we do a lot of that work at the National Fire Academy. That is a work in progress, thanks to the leadership of our Board of Visitors, Chris Neal, Dr. Manny Fonseca, uh, and uh, we continue to push that model to combine uh, different things. We already have a body of knowledge, and we have a system to acquire the knowledge, our local and state training academies and our colleges and universities in the country. We have outside systems to evaluate competency and assure it to, to the public, the IFSAC and the Pro Board, and of course we have a code of ethics. We have a journal, a refereed research journal, thanks to Dr. Bob England and the work that he's done here and supported by Fire Protection Publications. Uh, a, a dream, uh, a dream come true, really, for our, for our profession. And thanks to Dan Madrikowski, Dr. Lori Moore, who we're going to be hearing from soon, some of the greatest evidence-based research is now being published. So it's no longer stories of fires being passed down from generation to generation, but we're seeing scientifically developed evidence on what is the right and wrong way uh, to fight a fire. And uh, it's really, really neat to see the, the world kind of turned upside down. But it's not unique to our profession. Uh, the world of cancer, medical treatment and cancer, is going through the same kind of revolution. Because now, due to the ability to study DNA, they're beginning to realize that there is no such thing as site-specific cancer. There's no such thing as lung cancer or liver cancer or prostate cancer or over ovarian cancer or breast cancer. There are genes in all kinds of cancers that they attack the gene and they'll cure the disease. So you might have gene one, two, three, four, five, and this person might have it in their liver and this person might have it in their lung and it's treated the same way. And we've got some way to go about that, but over the years, next year or two years or three years, you're going to be, they'll be abandoning terms like liver cancer and lung cancer and using terms like this genetic code and that genetic code. And what about those who choose not to practice and who choose not to follow the path of professional development? Well, in every other profession this has happened. History shows that as the concept of professional development or professional standards took hold, outsiders either came into the professional fold or they ceased to practice. In the fire service, we look at our history, we are filled with history of changes, and there's no need to threaten or cajole. Uh, this will happen. It takes the initiative of men and women like you in this room uh, who choose to lead. So what do we have to do? What's the call to action? Well, in fact, what we've got to do now is keep all of these plates spinning. 
and that is to keep the professional development up and running. The training, the education, the experience, and the continuing education. And of course, adding more plates as we get more evidence-based practice. Um, there's probably very few times in your life you'll hear a fire chief quote Shakespeare, so I'm gonna do that for you. Um, in the play Julius Caesar, uh, Cassius and Brutus are discussing the assassination of Julius Caesar, who they're afraid is going to become an emperor or dictator, and they want to kill him. And Cassius says to Brutus, there comes a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads to fortune. Omitted, all the voyages of our lives are bound in shallows and in miseries. And on such a sea we are now afloat, and we must take our fortunes when they serve, or lose our opportunity, or lose our ventures. And what he was saying is that there comes a time when if you strike, you will lead to fortune. And if omitted, if you don't do it, uh, you're going to fail. And I think that the fire and emergency services is at that point. And it's these kinds of meetings and these kinds of conferences uh, that kind of restore my faith. And really the question to close is, if not us, who? And if not now, when? Thank you. We have time for questions, some questions. We've got uh, three minutes or so. Questions for okay. uh, we'll have oh, a, we have a question. Okay. I hope it's asked later. Uh, I, I'm in the you were talking about the demographics earlier. I'm I'm a Gen Xer. And uh, there's way fewer of us than the boomers. Yep. There's way fewer of us than the millennials who are pining. Mm -hmm. Um, has anybody looked at, with that rising population of senior citizens, what sort of staffing and personnel coming out of the generation behind them, how that's going to be affected in those kind of As I said, the environment is changing. So um, I'm hoping that the men and women studying their doctorates here at OSU and, and in other universities around the country begin to take a look at that, that issue. Um, it's not only the fire and emergency services. I'm more worried about you people paying Social Security than anything. Okay, yeah, okay, you gotta keep paying into that. Uh, Cause it's a pay as you go system, you know. We need, my father had eight kids that were all out working to pay his one Social Security check. I, you know, I've got two and they're not working out too well. Uh, so those are, the, those are the kinds of things our whole nation is gonna face and it's not just the fire and emergency services. Who else? Okay, thanks a lot, folks.